I'm Enrique Gonzalez Miller, and welcome to Are You Listening? In this season, we will be constructing a mix from start to finish, getting creative as we dig in there and explore emotional objectives. Why do we do the things that we do? Mix organization, developing efficiency. We'll do a rough mix, dealing with balance and panning. And finally, we will inspect the multi-track for any surprises that might lay ahead. Check out the show notes for tools, episodes, and resources as we set off to the road ahead. Seldom do we mix for ourselves. We are in the business of representing others, typically. If all of the hundred little mixing decisions we're about to take is going to influence and shape the emotional outcome of this piece of music, this piece of art that we're creating, we need to consider our clients. We need to consider our artists. And more specifically, we have to come up with an agreed upon objective. What does the verse develop into the pre-chorus and then it develops into the chorus? What should that emotional timeline and those peaks and valleys should be? So let's jump in and listen to the multi-track we received. This is going to be for a song called Kombucha, which we will listen to for uh, quite a bit as we will be constructing this track from nothing as we have now to final product. The band is called Winnetka Bowling League. Please take something to write and I will play this song for you top to bottom. You will see here that I have marked in my Pro Tool session the intro, verse one, pre-chorus one, chorus one. As we go through these sections, I want you to write down what vibe do you get? Just that raw emotion that you get. And when we're done with the whole track, I'd like for you to take a step back and go, for our intended audience, what's the overall macro emotion they should get? This is the multi-track as received, and I do not want you guys to pay attention to how it sounds, but rather just the music and how it's expressed through this arrangement. And again, the importance of this, guys, is we will be making hundreds of mixing decisions, but we need to have a north. We have to have a why we would take this decision versus the other. And that will ultimately amplify and bolster what this track is wanting to express. So without further ado, Kombucha by Winnetka Bowling League. <laughs> Guitar. Took your name off my guitar strap And threw out your non-fat Got back on my Prozac Covered my bedroom in white sage To send all your bad waves Back with you to Fort Wayne Don't try To follow me in my Honda on One on one It's time Swallow your kombucha and cry Yeah, why you always gotta rain on me and my vibes And let me slip into my meditation Yeah, yeah Give me witness protection for me and my friends Cause I never ever ever wanna see you again I got my Japanese dry snacks You see in my wolf pack A folder of new tracks And like the bird on your elbow I'm flexing my free flow Tika de la Beto. Don't try To wait for me outside of my show To say hello It's time Swallow your kombucha and cry Yeah, why you always gotta rain on me and my vibes Tripping up my good vibrations And let me slip into my meditation Tripping up my good vibrations Yeah, why you always gotta rain on me and my vibes Tripping up my good vibrations Life with no parole and no visitation Tripping up my good vibration. Yeah, yeah. Stop tripping up my good vibration. 
This preliminary listen through is very important because we are fresh. We have some objectivity still. <laughs> right now, what is probably happening is you guys are projecting whatever emotions you have to the sounds that you hear and capturing what you think and maybe what you think could be better is very important in this initial moment. Let me show you what I captured. As a macro emotional objective for me, this song wants to feel like a fun, quirky, body moving, rocking, psychedelic roller coaster ride. Let's zoom in section to section and distill how each section should feel and take notes, broadly speaking, on what items you hear are more responsible for these feelings. I, I will exemplify in a moment, but if we listen to the intro, let's go check it out. Fucking sucky guitar. What's the point of this intro? It's this long, but it's important. Why? Because it's the tone setter. So for me, this intro needs to feel disorienting and kind of small. This is so that I can have room to grow for the verse. Let's go check out the verse. Took your name off my guitar strap And threw out your non-fat Got back on my prose Covered my bedroom in white sage To send all your bad waves back with you to Fort Wayne Don't So what's the verse about? If you ask me, the verses should be quirky. And I'm going to try to get that by making the drum beat, very dry, staccato, narrow, and mono. Start observing how I'm approaching this, right? I want it to feel this way, and I'm gonna get that from the drums. I want them to be dry, I want them to be staccato, narrow, and mono. I also want this to feel kind of gritty and scrawny, and that's gonna come from the bass. I want the quirk and the grit to come from that. Then I wrote here, I just woke up disorientation. That's another vibe that I want from this verse. That I'm gonna get out of the vocals. I'm gonna try to make them somewhat muffled and saturated. And then finally, I want the verses to also feel psychedelic. And this will come from those female vocals that I like to put a flanger on them to get that psychedelia. Now let's go check out the pre-chorus. Try to follow me in my Honda For me, it has this kind of bipolar contrast, right? It's small and quirky and then big and bombastic. And I'm going to get that out of the guitars, the drums and the guitars more specifically. I want when that heavy part comes in, I want it to feel metal. I wrote here. Now let's go check out that chorus and see what we want this to become. And let me slip into my meditation yeah, yeah. So for chorus one, my notes were First half, I want it to be triumphant and psychedelic And we're going to achieve that with wide stereo clean vocals And feature a guitar and synth line that is there I'm really going to feature that if you're listening to me talk and you're going 
where do these ideas come from? What I'm asking you to do is to hold yourselves responsible to envisioning what this mix could be. And that's where, when I say first half, I want it to become triumphant and psychedelic. This is the potential that I hear. And I'm following it up with, well, how am I going to get this? All right, with those clean vocals, which I'm going to make white stereo and that. That's what I'm going to push forward. Continuing on. The second half should be similar to that pre-chorus, but it should really feel like fist pumping 90s rock. Brighter distorted guitars, bass not distorted like we had in the verse, but rather warm and enveloping. And then on chorus three, which comes later, I just wrote a little note that says, keep the beginning psychedelic. So chorus three is a bit of a breakdown. So here I'm just writing that I would like it to be very, very washy and psychedelic and dreamy. Then we have the interludes, which go like this. Endless protection for me and my friends Cause I never ever ever wanna see you again Similar to the intro, I want it to become disorienting and feel somewhat kind of wounded. Treat those vocals with lowered formats. So here, these are ideas. I'm thinking that maybe I could go and double the vocals and make them kind of Darth Vader-y low, and that will give them kind of a creepy vibe. Very last section is the solo, which sounds like this. And finally for that, the first half make dirty and aggressive, distort the solo even more, broken transistor radio sound, and then auto pan the tambourine. Finally, on the second half, I want it to be dreamy and spacious. The vocals drenched in reverb, crispy acoustic guitar, and really feature those claps. Those are my macro emotional objectives, and these are my micro emotional objectives. And when I get into the weeds of decision making, I need to always remind myself, what should this feel like? And again, that feel like is to the potential of the track, but it also goes back to that agreed upon objective you have with your client, with your artists. The next thing we need to do is make sure we can do so efficiently. In other words, we need to go look at our mix organization. If you were with us on Are You Listening? Season 4, I did a deep dive on mix organization. And here what I would like to show you is how I have deployed those concepts, again, for maximum mixing efficiency. So this is the multi-track as I have organized it. But things weren't always this way from the beginning. Let me show you what I was actually given to begin with. So this is what the multi-track used to look like. When I look at this, I don't quite at a glance understand it. And it's not because it's disorganized. It's just because it's complex. It's intricate. And I didn't do it. So I needed to go in and in a way detangle and understand the infrastructure of what was given to me. So what I opted to do rather than dive into the mix that was already started maybe by the band when they were doing rough mixes for themselves is I just started from scratch. <laughs> so I took all of these auxes, all of these audio files that maybe like you see here, audio for underscore, I don't really know what that means and it's difficult for me to navigate. So what I did was organize it in the following way. The first thing you see here are families of different instruments, top to bottom. So here in Stylish Blue, are my drums, and these are my chorus drums. I put them first because they are the most important part of the beat is actually those heavy chorus beats. Then I have the drums in the verse, which arguably are less important than the heavy hitting chorus drums. Percussion, bass, guitars, keyboards, then vocals. So in short, I have 
an order that goes from most foundational instruments, the beat, to the things that then start complementing the beat to the bass, to the guitars, to the keyboards. And then because they're so important, almost separately, I have vocals. Now, this is not the way that it is done, but I'm inviting you to consider some sort of organization, something that, again, you can find things very efficiently as you move through. Then, of course, you see that things are track colored so that I can navigate easily. You also see that I removed a lot of quote unquote dead air. So this means that, for example, if I'm looking at this shaker track, I cut out all of the pieces of audio that had nothing on them so that I can see the arrangement really easily. And then finally, create aux tracks. This is the bass right here. This bass has two tracks that together make up one sound. So this is the bass. And it's two tracks. It's this one. And this one. Together, they make up the bass. So what I've done is I've created an aux where the outputs of these two tracks are going to the input of my aux and I'm summing them together this way. And then finally, every group of instrument I'm also putting out of another aux, which serves as a aux that encompasses the group of the entire family. Let me explain. So here we have this bass. We also have another bass that happens during the choruses. Here I have a bass that happens only at the end. And we also have a sub bass. All of these are then being output of a master aux. That's as far as I get with my mix organization. I need to prepare for this trip, right? You're going on a long trip. You want to put gas in the car. You want to get a map to know where you're going, your emotional objectives. You want to pack some snacks. You want to go. You don't want to start your trip and then 10 minutes in go, I don't have any gas and I'm starving hungry. And where are we going again? No, all of this stuff is ready to go so that now we can get to the fun of mixing. Now that we have our emotional objectives squared away, our mix completely organized, now we start putting our hands on this mix. First thing we're going to do is, does it feel musical? We have been given a rough mix. And this rough mix, we can assume that this is what the artist vouches for right? This is what they said. This is in good enough shape. This represents me here. Have it. Now you go take it to the next level. What I'm going to ask us to do is listen for balance and panning. The balance is the level relationship between the different sounds in the arrangement. So think about kick to snare, kick to snare, two overheads. Drums to bass, drums, bass to guitars and keyboards, rhythm section to vocals. For this, I will ask you to try to tap into your instincts. I will hit play and I will play us verse one through pre chorus one, chorus one, and interlude one. And then I'm going to skip over to the solo so that we can listen to every discrete section of the song. And I would like for you just let's keep it very simple, balance and panning. I will hit play, make your notes. And once we're done, I'll tell you what I hear could be improved. Here we go. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non-fat got back on my prose Covered my bedroom in white sage To send all your bad waves back with you to Fort Wayne Don't try to follow me in my Honda on one on It's time to swallow your kombucha and cry Yeah, why you always gotta rain on me and my vibes Tripping up my good vibrations And let me slip into my meditation 
Yo te mato por tanto Yeah, yeah Give me witness protection for me and my friends Cause I never ever ever wanna see you again All right, and now the solo. So if this went by and it felt like it was a little quick and you would like to listen to this again, of course, this is a cooking show. You can rewind the video and, and watch it again. But this is the exercise. So when you guys are mixing, I want you to listen to the entire track and make notes on anything that you feel the balance in the panning could be better. Specifically, what do I hear? Here, I have highlighted and made myself notes for everything that I think could improve. Starting with the verse, it feels like the balance between the kick and the snare, the kick is a little too quiet. I also feel like the bass is a little hard to understand what the notes are. And finally, I think the vocals are a little bit too loud. How does one know if the vocals are too loud? They just feel like they're here and the rest of the instruments are back there. And where does the, the energy, the muscle come from? It's really the instruments. So I think if the vocals maybe take a back seat a little bit more, it's going to make, so these are the instruments and, and these are the vocals. It's gonna make them feel like they are supporting and give a little bit more kind of aggression and, and energy to the track. So check it out. Took your name off my guitar strap And threw out your non-fat Got back on my Prozac Covered my bedroom in white sage To send all your bad waves Back with you to Fort Wayne So my very quick moves here are going to be Which is the kick drum? It's this guy right here And threw out your non-fat so I'm just going to bring this up and I don't care about the number. I'm just going to bring this up until it feels like I want it to feel, which is more body moving. So here we go. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non-fat. Got back on my Prozac. Covered my bedroom in white sage to send all your bad waves back with you to Fort Wayne. Don't try. There. So you saw me overshoot it, then come back and then put it to yes, where my cheat sheet said I should go because this is a cooking show. Rewind this and, and play it again if you'd like to. But I want you to, with fearlessness, just hit play. If it doesn't quite feel right, don't worry about the number. Just make the move until you feel it really embody what you'd like it to, to be like emotionally. And that happened to be 24 for me. Now let's go talk about the bass. For the bass, we have two tracks you might remember. And those two tracks are the following. We have a lower octave. And then we have a higher octave, this one. If what I want is more definition, seeing now that I've been given a choice, if we listen, Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non I think the articulation from that higher octave one is really going to make it become clearer. So I'm going to turn that one up. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non Got back on my Prozac. Covered my bedroom in white sage to send all your bad waves back with you to Fort Wayne. Don't try. That sounds just fine for me. And then finally, on vocals, I said they were a little bit loud, so. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non -fat. Got back on my Prozac. Covered my bedroom in white sage to send all your bad waves back with you to Fort Wayne. Don't try. And that sounds great to me. So again, how do we know when it's not too quiet or not too loud? With vocals, obviously, if they're super quiet, you start to lose intelligibility. That's an easy one. If you overdo it, they start sounding super detached. But then there's this whole gray area, right? Where, where within that gray area do you put them? It really depends on what emotion you want out of the track. And I keep going back to this word emotion. 
but it's this. If we were mixing a Celine Dion track, right, and it was all about the vocals and the orchestra is back there somewhere, these vocals would probably be a lot louder. But this is a rock track, so the band needs to feel tough. And that's, I'm trying to create that with nesting the vocals a little bit into the instruments. Then we have the pre-chorus. These guitars are just not loud enough. Remember how I said that I wanted this kind of bipolar contrasty, psychedelic and then heavy tough. Check it out. Does it feel heavy tough? Try to follow me in my Honda on. On. Not so much. I would like to turn them up, but I'm also seeing here that we have two sets of stereo guitars and they're both panned hard left and right, each one. So I'm thinking that maybe if they are just the same sound, I want them to be not only louder, but also wider. And maybe we can achieve this by grabbing this whole track and panning it to one side to the left and grabbing the other one and panning it to the right. So let's see what this does to the impact. And again, don't worry that I just push the button and whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna hit play and when it happens, does it hit you like you want it to? Try to follow me in my Honda on one on it's time. The answer is yes, spoiler. <laughs> so I'm gonna play you the before quickly, then play you the after. Here's the before. Try to follow me in my Honda on And here's the act. Try to follow me in my Honda on one on one. It's time. The rock has entered the room. So that's a bit better. Two last quick things. When the chorus comes in, it's these two halves, right? One of them is more psychedelic, the other one is heavier. I think we need a little bit more of both. So if we listen, there's that dum ding da da ding, ding synth that you'll hear. It's not quite poking out too much. Rain on me and my vibe. And who's responsible for that? It's really this synth right here. So of course I'm gonna bring that up. Check it out. So once again, you always gotta rain on me and my and let me slip into my meditation. Great. It's a little loud. It's a little obnoxious, but it really makes the point, which is great. The very last thing that I have, because by the way, the solo I thought sounded great, is this guitar. This is the top end of that same synth, so I'm just going to bring it up quite a bit until it pops out a little bit more. And here is the after. It's subtle. It just pokes out a little bit more and it also feels a little bit lighter and thinner. And this is going to give me a great contrast to that heavy part. So of course, I mentioned that in this cooking show, I am going a bit fast because I want to keep things moving and I've made myself some notes, et cetera, et cetera. I want you guys to think that this multi-track has a number of tracks, right? And I haven't hit solo on every single one of them so we can check. The exercise is make your notes on what is not satiating emotionally and then go fish for the tracks that are most responsible to give you that feeling that you're going for. So in that way you go, <clears throat> it feels like 
there's not enough edge and top end on that motif in the chorus. And then I go find, oh, this is the track that most effectively is going to get me there. Panning, shall we? We're done with the balance portion, and the balance is very, as I said, keep it instinctual. Panning is trying to gain some clarity and width. In our previous season, I had mentioned the reasoning as to why when I have a kick and a snare and then you finally get the hi-hat, where do you pan it? You could pan it to the left and have it be drummer's perspective. You can pan it opposite and have it be audience perspective. But why? At that stage of the game, it's just a matter of preference. The thing is that if you pan the hi-hat to the left, now you've made your entire mix lopsided with this one high frequency item to one side. This is going to yield an emotional byproduct. And then when you find something like, say, a tambourine, which is of a very similar sound and frequency footprint, you might choose to make it more symmetrical by panning it opposite. Let's go take a look at specifically this song and see what we could make better, not only technically, but emotionally. So in my notes, after critical listening, I find that the verse is quite wide. Check it out. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non-fat and got back on my Prozac. Cut. The verse already starts almost hard left and right. And this is counterproductive to what I'd like this to be, which is when the pre-chorus comes, I want this to have that contrast of the heavy part be very wide and then it collapses back. So I want to use panning as an emotional tool. And this informs my decisions, which are what is making the verse wide, this snare. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non- It's way to the right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to center this so that the snare is dead center. I'm going to collapse this verse a little bit more. Then I also have these overheads with the hi-hat panned to the left quite a bit. So I'm going to bring that in a little bit. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non-fat and got back on my Prozac. Cut. Better. Here is the before, way wide, on the snare and the hi-hat. So halfway through the verse, I'm going to put it back. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non-fat and got back on my Prozac. Covered my bedroom in white sage to send all your bad waves back with you to Fort Wayne. And you hear how it centers right in, and yes, it feels smaller, but it doesn't matter that it's smaller, which doesn't mean worse. It just means giving myself some room to be bigger later. Then we have this shaker. And you see that it's happening in the verse. So because I have my hi-hat to the left in the overheads, I'm going to pan the shaker opposite to the right. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non-fat and got back on my Prozac. Covered my bedroom in white sage. So I'm adding a little bit of width, but it's not super, super wide. I'm just getting the shaker out of the way of the overhead for clarity. And then we have this tambourine. Try to follow me in my Honda. I'm going to pan this tambourine opposite to the shaker so that I can have a little bit of, of interplay. Try to follow me in my Honda on the 101. It's time to swap. It's very subtle, but it's making for a good counterpoint. Don't and there you go. So here in the chorus, I spotted the following. We have this guitar track, which is mighty, mighty, mighty important. That guitar 
is super important. It's the one rock guitar that gives us the heavy, but it's thin and it's panned hard right. So I'm just making myself a note here that I will eventually have to fabricate a fake stereo version of this. So right now I'm just gonna leave it as is, but I've made myself a note so that when I get to Guitarville, official word for when we do guitars, I will double it and fake stereo make something. So that's just my little note on panning. And we have the penultimate thing, these vocals. If we listen to the verse. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non got back on my Prozac. It's these. Covered my bedroom in white sage to send all your bad waves back with you to Fort Wayne. And those. So it's these two sets of vocals really that make up the substance of the verse. These high vocals Took your name off my guitar are currently in mono. Took your name off my guitar strap. And you remember how in my emotional objectives I had written that I wanted this verse to sound psychedelic and kind of a little wounded in a way, I'd like these higher vocals to encompass the lead. So I'm gonna pan them out a little bit more. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non fat got back on my Prozac. Covered my bedroom in white sage to send all your bad waves back with you to Fort Wayne. Great. Final, final, final thing, these leads that happen in the chorus. So when we come to the chorus, it's really these vocals that are the lead. Check them out. Rain on me and my vibes. Tripping up my good vibration. And they are pretty much in mono. Stop tripping up my good vibrations. So we have three high vocals. Stop tripping up my good vibration. And three low vocals. So I want these vocals to be the widest thing that we have heard at this point in the arrangement. So what I'm going to do is make an executive decision. I'm going to mute one of these vocals. Dun dun dun. I'm going to mute one of these vocals, but I'm not going to mute a part. So this is an executive decision to try to gain more stereo. Because I have three, what I will do is grab one of them and I'm going to mute them. I'm going to make them inactive so that I can grab the other two and pan them hard left and right. You can imagine that if I have one vocal hard left, one hard right, but one in the center, it's going to feel not as wide as if I just have two discrete ones. Let's go check out how this chorus feels with the impact of with. Why you always gotta rain on me and my vibes. And let me slip into my meditation. Excellent. And if I very quickly put these back, this is where we were. And my And let me slip into my meditation. And this to me feels like a great, great rough mix. Are you guys tired? I hope not, because we're going to listen to this song a whole mess of a lot. Before we pack this up, though, I want to do a test of fire, 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 and have us listen to where we were and how we are. So here at the top, I have imported a rough mix of the track sent to me. This is exactly what the artist sent. Took your name off my guitar strap. So let's go listen to the before and after and see how these two versions feel. I'm going to play the verse, but the first half will be the before, the second half will be the after. Here we go. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your non fat got back on my Prozac. Covered my bedroom in white sage to send all your bad waves back with you to Fort Wayne. 
So the difference is subtle, but what I do get is things are a little bit smaller and the vocals are a little bit more nested, which is exactly what I want so that I can have room to expand in the pre-chorus. Now let's go check this pre-chorus and I'm actually going to play only half of it in loop. So the first time around will be again the before and when it loops on this first half, it will be the after. Check it out. Try to follow me in my Honda on the 101. Let's try to follow me in my Honda on the 101. Let's oh yes, way better. Those guitars came in and they're so much more satiating. Now let's go for the chorus. And let me slip into my meditation vibe. And let me slip into my meditation vibe. And there you have it. Now we have a mix that is properly balanced and has great spatial distribution. And this is really going to pave the way to efficient mixing once we get into drums and later bass and so and so and so. Remember how I said we are now ready to jump in and I kind of lied. The last thing we're going to do before jumping into drums in the near future is inspect the multitrack. Inspect it for what? For issues, mainly technical issues, but also emotional issues, right? Is the arrangement or the sounds in the multitrack really going to help us achieve the sounds and the vibe that we're going for, right? The proverbial audio rubber band only stretches so far. So I love those drums in the chorus to feel gigantic. We need to inspect to see if they will help us get there or if we need to go and do a little bit of editing, a little bit maybe of a sample replacement, maybe a little bit of doctoring. So the gesture now is to go listen to, for example, the verse. Took your name off my guitar strap. And then here, start soloing track by track just to see the state of things and so that you can get a bit more intimacy, for lack of a better word, so that you know exactly what track is doing what and how they come together. So if we do that for the verse, let's go and solo the tracks in the drums and see what we've been given. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw out your Kick sample. Kick snare. Interesting. So we have a collection of somewhat disparate sounds that together feel like drums. Took your name off my guitar strap. And this is cool. So we have a kick sample that sounds okay. We have this kick snare thing that seems like overheads or room mics, which is also nice. We have this snare sample, which sounds a little bit too normal and plasticky. So I made myself a note here. Then we have this suitcase snare that we pan and collapse to the center. We have claps in double time and we have the overheads, which we also collapsed a little bit. So here I'm just making myself a note that this snare, as I think to my emotional objective, which is make the verse quirky and scrawny and wounded, a lot of it for me has to do with the character of the snare. And this snare sounds too normal and plasticky for lack of a better word. So I am making myself a note, as you can see, that this is something that I will revisit. I've also written here that, for example, this kick in the pre-chorus, check it out. This one here is quite noisy. So this is an issue, right? It's an issue because I'm thinking ahead of, I'm going to be compressing this thing a lot. I'm going to add a lot of low end, a lot of top end for the beater. And this amount of noise is going to be 
aggravated when I do this. Note to self, you might have to replace this with a sample. Then this snare we have here, I envision the pre-chorus to have these rocking drums and tell me if you think this snare rocks. Try to follow me on my no, not so much. And if we go and inspect this, With all due love and respect, no, it does not rock. Okay, so note to self, augment with a punchy, longer sample. Moving right along, this bass, if we listen, the issue in my notes is that it's very dynamic and there are some mistakes here. If we listen and we find that there are what we deem as mixers, mistakes, we can't just willy-nilly go in and start editing and changing what the client gave us, what the artist feels that does represent them. We need to have a conversation with them. So let's listen, and then we'll take up that. Uh, so what do we do? Check it out. Took your name off my guitar strap and threw up in the... So this bass sounds like it's a loop, and in the loop, Took your name off my guitar strap and threw up your non which is that long, there seems to be a missing note. Can you hear that? So, so I'm making myself a note that this needs to be fixed, question mark. I'm also seeing that there's a lot of amplitude discrepancies, and this I anticipate might be an issue with a compressor that sees input that is going up and down quite a bit. If we deem that this is an issue, and we go and edit the notes to be different, we just need to make sure that our artists are cool with this. For the purpose of this show, we are assuming a position where the artist has said, Enrique, dude, do your thing. Be as creative as you'd like. Bring our track to places that we haven't heard them before. So I will go later on and proceed, but this is my note to self. And my final one is that here towards the end, we have this bass live out. <laughs> So my note is the track is distorting, as you can clearly see, and you can clearly see in the meter. And then in the middle, the amplitude is considerably lower. So my anticipated issue is that if I put a plugin on this, the plugin is probably going to distort right away. So note to self is amplitude editing. I'm going to grab everything that is very loud, and I'm going to cut and gain that down to be more in line with that quieter part. We will do this when we get to bass in a future lesson. But again, these are all my note to self after I inspect the multi-track. And now we are ready to proceed. <laughs> 